Good evening and welcome. This is the People's Platform. As the people's protests across the country grow in momentum and intensity, so do their hardships. Simultaneously, we are witness to the manner in which the elected representatives of the people act in absolute disdain and disregard of the very people, the very citizens who elected them into public office. Tonight's discussion will focus on how we can bridge this ever-widening gap between the people of the Republic and their Parliament. Before embarking on tonight's show, here's a recap of last week. Apart from bringing the 19th Amendment back, uh, ensure also that these, these commissions, that the appointments are again there is a reappraisal of the appointments within a specified period and that to be handed back to the Constitutional Council, which we should be right, to review these appointments and make fresh appointments. And in, at the same time, bring those mechanisms like the procurement agency and strengthen the bribery department. The President and the Prime Minister must go, mm. quite apart from the cry for the 225 to also go. And that is why even the bar has advocated firstly the President should resign. Mm -hmm. because there is a clause in the constitution where he can tender his resignation. Mm -hmm. So one expects, when one cannot, there has been a series of failures and one has to be responsible enough to take responsibility and say in a private sector, one just resigns honorably and goes home before you are terminated, mm -hmm. right? So that one should realize the feel of the people and know that you have hit, you have brought us to this stage. I'm not saying that it's only this president who has brought us. Maybe serious presidents have done equally badly or... No, probably not worse. It's a lot worse. Mm -hmm. But one has to have the humility to understand that there's a big breach of trust, a huge credibility gap in your ability to perform. I'm not talking of corruption or abuse of power. Mm -hmm. You're the incompetent, inept. You have failed to deliver and you have made all the wrong judgments and decisions on several counts. So you can't insist, you should not, it's not fair to the country and the people that you should insist on remaining. Mm -hmm. So too with the Prime Minister, so too with the whole cabinet and perhaps the 225 as these young people are clamoring for. And that is why we have said the President, Prime Minister should resign, immediately repeal the 20th Amendment which has created a lot of problems for us. The 19th Amendment as Mr. Mustafa says needs fine tuning because you can't have the President and the Prime Minister at loggerheads. Mm. Caretaker cabinet, because our immediate, our immediate problem is the economic problems. Right. Where we have to survive that, and that's going to take a long time, maybe a year or two. This is episode six of the People's Platform. Our guests tonight are Dr. Pakya Soti Sarvan Muttu, uh, Executive Director of the Center for Policy Alternatives. Good, Good evening, evening and welcome. Uh, we are also joined by Attorney at Law Ermiza Teagle. Good evening, Good evening and evening. welcome. Um, before embarking on tonight's topic um, surrounding the political mismanagement, the economic calamity that the country is in. I'd like to do a, a, a mental check and check in with you both. Um, how are you doing? How are you doing, Dr. Sarun Mutwa? I remember I interviewed you five years ago and I asked you, don't you get tired of <laughs> <laughs> of, of, of your job, just keep holding uh, governments to account for how many decades has it been now? How, how are you keeping? How are you holding up? Well, we're chugging along. Mm -hmm. I suppose we live vicariously off the energy of the young people who are, have come out so magnificently. But, you know, it's not easy. It's never a straight line. Yeah. It's always, you know, two steps forward, maybe three steps backwards. It's... but. It is something that if you're committed to, you just cannot give up. You have to be patient and resilient. Um, Amiza, you work um, predominantly in the area of human rights, rights reform in Sri Lanka. How has it been? How have you been coping? I think the day-to-day -day problems that we've always had even before the protest started seem to be continuing full force even through this time. Mm. So the number of complaints with regard to domestic violence, the number of complaints with regard to also families of detainees, those still continue mm. regardless of this. So it's over, over the usual day-to-day -day 
problems and issues that you're trying to address, that you're also having to give your mind attention and energy. So it's very draining, certainly. But also I think the protests particularly and seeing all of the people out there raising their voices does give you hope that there is a moment for change as well. Yeah, I think this this has been an absolute um, moment of opportunity also where we see this uh, resurgence in public consciousness like never before. Um, all right, uh, fantastic. Uh, Dr. Saranamuthu, uh, around five minutes ago, uh, we just got this news alert and let me read it out to uh, for, for, for the benefit of our viewers. Um, let me see if I can find the English alert. Re-elected Deputy Speaker of Parliament Ranjit Simbla Pitya has decide, decided to resign again with immediate effect. Re-elected Deputy Speaker of Parliament Ranjit Simbla Pitya has decided to resign again with immediate effect. Um, Dr. Saranamuthu, people are not um, idiots to be to be mocked at so callously with so much disregard. The disrespect is just atrocious. Um, what must we now do when there is such a wide gap between the parliament and the citizens who are suffering in in such um, human ways they can't find medicine they can't find food fuel i know i mean this farcical absolutely farcical thing about resigning and then taking a job and resigning again it is ridiculous it brings parliament into disrepute mm. it pits parliament against the people who are demanding democratic reform, basically. Yeah. So all I can see is this, is, is that, look, if the figures that came out with regard to the re-election of Ranjit Simbala Pitya as Deputy Speaker are the figures that there are only 65 with the opposition mm. and 148 with the government, a no-confidence motion either against the President or the Prime Minister is not going to work. Yeah. Now, we have a Hartal call today in three days' time, we may well have a Hartal call for an indefinite duration until the demands of the protesters are made. Yeah. I think Parliament has to come online with the people. We have to go to a general election, you know, because otherwise you're going to get all 225 seen as culprits of one kind or another. Mm. And it's not just Gota go, it is Gota, Mahinda and the rest of you 225 go as well. It's started already. Mm. And if you discredit the institutions of government and governance that we have, we are then heading for a kind of anarchy. So then we have to call for a general election. The opposition has to take a stand, campaign on the basis of the abolition of the executive presidency, because Gotabe Rajpaksa won't vacate office. And let's see what happens. Hopefully that the opposition wins. Um, through all of this, uh, Misa, it is the working people who are suffering. It's not the parliamentarians who are suffering. Um, especially if we take issues like microfinancing, where loan sharks go into people's houses and demand repayment of these exorbitant interest rates. Uh, and in their failure to pay up, they either ask for sexual bribes or they threaten to illegally arrest you. Uh, and we, we've had, uh, statistically speaking, over 200 deaths where people have just killed themselves because they haven't been able to pay. Now, this mm. is a huge is issue with, with people like three-wheeler drivers, lorry drivers. Mm. Um, how do we look at this aspect? I think this was an issue that we also um, spoke about or saw mm. with the pandemic yeah. coming in. And there were lots of people who went into debt or also had accumulated debt, household debt, this is, right? Yeah. And it has been an issue that has been raised various times at various elections and not really addressed. So when we hit this crisis, which significantly increases that burden of debt on the household, we are also seeing in this instant parliament just not responding yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. And that's a real failure on the part of people who say that they represent the public. 
Um, these are institutional issues, systemic issues that have not been addressed for a long time. We've had calls for um, cancellation of household debts. It has been done before in Sri Lanka as part of uh, humanitarian response. I think in 1995 when uh, farmers in the dry zone required it, it was done. Okay. This is also a time to respond in recognition of this humanitarian crisis that is unfolding. Right, right. And I think the microfinance issue is one of many issues. Mm. The food crisis is another. And there are many sectors, Sonali. I mean, it's um, that we are looking at fisheries, we're looking at uh, farmers, agricultural sector. All of these sectors require a response. Mm -hmm. Instead, we've had a month of protests yeah. and not a single word being said about any of these issues. Uh, Dr. Sarvanamuthu, now, Parliament is supposed to um, meet and discuss responses to these issues faced by the people. Now, that's not happening. Parliament has been... Uh, Urge until I think the 19th of this 17th or 19th, yeah. whatever. Yeah. The 19th. Um, so then who's going to find solutions to these issues and how do we go about finding solutions to these issues faced by the people? Well, effectively, Parliament has abrogated hmm. the responsibility of doing anything about the current situation. Yeah. I just cannot understand as to why Parliament can't sit again till the 19th. This is a national crisis. It's an extreme, dire political crisis as well. And what are they? Today is the 6th of May. They're taking 13 days off to do what? Well, I mean, I would have thought, therefore, that the opposition needs to come out and sort of say, look, we are with the people who are protesting. We are not going to be part of any government that includes the Rajapaksas. And therefore, we call for a general election. And Parliament must then vote by a simple majority to dissolve itself and resolve this issue. Then the protesters, too, can ensure that there are people who they can trust, who they have faith in and confidence in, who can represent them. You know, but, you know, by giving themselves, you know, effectively a holiday, for 13 days, almost two weeks, when the country is at the verge of bankruptcy and where political leadership is not there, it's, it's absurd, it's unthinkable, it's un incomprehensible. Um, Amiza, uh, let's talk about um, some of the issues faced by um, the uh, free trade zone workers who also joined in the protests. So the protests haven't been limited to just Colombo and its suburbs, but we've seen people from the north and east who, have, who are quite used to protesting, sadly, but have been ignored for all of this, uh, this time. Uh, we've seen that convergence. <clears throat> um, since you also do a lot of work uh, with um, the free trade zone, um, labor issues. Uh, speak to us about some of the key concerns that they raise. Um, I'm not engaged with the free trade zone workers in that way. I do some issues with some of the trade unions working with the plantation sector, um, but working people in yes, general, the working I classes. think, is something that needs to be raised at this point. I, I also just want to say that it's, it is incomprehensible like uh, Dr. Saranmuthi just said, that there is no sitting down of all parties, regardless, and just working through these issues right now. Mm. Like working through the weekends, working through the nights if needed, to find solutions together even, but better if it's together, but at least keep throwing up these issues for the consumption of people to understand that these are being looked into. In terms of working people, if you just take the plantation sector, They've been struggling with her. Their, their struggle for a thousand rupee day wage has been going on for the last few years. Yeah. It was only very in, recently that there was a decision taken by the wages board to give the thousand rupees day wage. And immediately the employers went to court. And, has, and ever since the decision was taken, 
we know that the companies have undermined the decision to pay the 1000 rupee wage by various practices of increasing the load that has to be picked for the day to a uh, level that cannot humanly be collected in a day. So then you don't get the 1000 rupees if you don't collect that amount of kilos of tea. Mm. Uh, various other practices that undermine trade union activity, not maintaining the plantation so that people can't work, not giving the 25 days assured to them under the collective agreement. The collective agreement also has not been signed. So all the labor protections that the plantation workers would have generally had been able to access, they no longer were able to access. They were not even earning the 25,000 that they needed to earn a day. And it is on the back of that insensitivity, the back of that crisis that they were facing, that we are now facing cost of living going up. How do you expect people to survive? When we looked at indebtedness in the plantation sector, we saw 73% of the households in debt. Mm. What kind of figure is 73% of a population to be in, in debt? We're looking at some of the poorest in Sri Lanka with poverty at 8.8% compared to rural poverty at 4 point something in Sri Lanka and urban at 1.9. Even when we talk about poverty levels in Sri Lanka, we're talking about the standard poverty definition, right? Even Samurti. So all of these areas needed a boost in terms of re-envisioning what needed to be done to ensure basic needs to people, Sonali. It's a basic ensuring health, nutrition, education, we were missing the mark. And now in the middle of a crisis where people are going to fall through the cracks, we're talking about homelessness, we're talking about starvation, we're talking about malnutrition. And if this is not scaring representatives of the people, I don't know what it takes really. Um, I know small women's groups that are trying to sort of come up with ideas about just keeping, how do they maintain themselves through this food crisis? And try to think of like small practical measures, but the responsibility really lies with government mm -hmm. and lies with people who are representing yeah, them. Absolutely. Uh, let's take a, few, uh, a look at a few tweets from this week. Uh, Anisha says, if you're in a supermarket and you see someone struggling to pay, or if someone asks you to buy them something, if you have the means, please do consider helping out. No one wants to have to ask for money or food. And those that do only ask because they absolutely have to. Everyone is struggling now, especially low income daily wage workers with many going to bed hungry each night. Please do help out whenever you can, if your means allow it. Uh, and the next tweet uh, from Sahan Dahanayaka. Hariyatam ilakka karala gahuwe kama tibba tentekata. Meka thavaduratat minisu ekka neme amanusyo ekka tiyana satanak. To which Anoma D always replies, Shame on you people. Pare vatila in asarana satekuta pava kama tikak dena samajeka. Me dahas gananaka daruanta kanna tibuna kama vulta mehemakare ai. During a food crisis, why destroy food? And the final tweet from Hansika, who says, My public health midwives tell me they can no longer tell mothers to feed babies with what we usually advise on feeding them. Fish, eggs, yogurt, etc. Now they tell the mothers to feed babies with whatever nutrition that they can find. Example, boiled jackfruit. One mother told us that she boils one egg, hides it and feeds it to the youngest child who is losing weight while the other two kids go to school. Um, Dr. Sarvan Muttu, these protests will keep intensifying. We need to ensure that the protesters are equipped with the knowledge um, so that they, their rights aren't violated, their right to peaceful assembly their right of um, expression, that the, these rights are not um, infringed or violated by the authorities. Um, Amiza, I'd like to ask you specifically 
um, since you're an attorney at law, uh, how must um, the protesters equip themselves with this knowledge? For example, there was a video going around uh, saying, look, the police is telling us not to record with our phones, right? Uh, speak to us about the basic rights uh, and responsibilities that the protest, the information that the protesters need to now equip themselves with. And the basic right to uh, the freedom of assembly is a constitutional right, Absolutely. It's a fundamental right. Peaceful assembly, that's all you need to do, peacefully assemble. Mm. The, po the threshold at which that changes and where the police can actually intervene is when it becomes an unlawful assembly, an assembly that has um, uh, the intent or is engaged in any kind of illegal activity. Mm. But until that point is crossed, people are able to video record anything that they want, mm. say anything that they want against anybody that they want, because we do have freedom of speech in this country. Um, it can be annoying, it can be difficult, particularly against public figures. You are permitted to say more than you generally would have been able to in terms of even the defamation laws that stretches because criticism is something that public officials really need to hear mm. in terms of their conduct, in terms of their track record, in terms of what they are doing in the country. So anything goes in that sense. All you cannot do is engage in any kind of illegal conduct, which means causing harm, hurt, mm. uh, destruction of public property. But we are seeing, what we are seeing is an intensifying on escalation of violence caused by the police, by engaging in intimidatory tactics, by uh, falsely saying that orders have been obtained for the protests to be uh, disbanded or to be, or the protesters to be removed. Mm -hmm. uh, and and what, what are these tactics? In the constitution ensures that the, the state has to actually promote, facilitate the freedom of assembly mm. and the freedom of expression. So then intimidation goes against that. So where is the facilitation? Um, we, so we are, at this point, the protesters are in the right and what we've seen as tactics are completely undermining the protections provided for in the constitution. Dr. Saravanamuthu, while we're still talking about the protests, um, you would have seen um, the manner in which the police had fired, um, used water cannons directly on the tents which were serving the food for the protesters. Whilst we're going through such a terrible food crisis, I mean, anyway, even without a food crisis, that's wrong. Um, that's one point. Then the second is when people have no access to affordable medicines uh, and food and other essentials how are we how is the police how are the armed forces getting uh, all of these um, um, gadgets of uh, um, protester dispersal masks and all of these things so who who's who's questioning these well <coughs> why these protest dispersal equipment is available to the police, etc., is as a consequence of the priorities of the government of the day. The government of the day understands the police as being its sort of personal protection force. The police is there to serve the people, and the police has a responsibility to uphold the people's enjoyment of their fundamental rights, like freedom of speech, freedom of association, uh, all of that, you know, so we have to also change the the paradigm of governance that we have in this country. The police are a key target of that mm -hmm. in terms of we know what the reputation of the police has been with regard to torture and all of those kinds of things. Not that the entire police force is guilty of it, but it does have a stain on its reputation and we need to change all of that. But you can't change it with a government that is obstinately refusing, adamantly, obstinately refusing to heed what the people are saying to it. 
you know, and so the police too, or in indeed, even the armed services will be caught up in this situation of the politicians, the ruling regime on the one hand, the people on the other, and who are they responsible to in a functioning democracy? I would have thought that at the end of the day, their responsibility is to the people of this country. You know, so we need complete change of that sort of paradigm of governance or government that we have. And how do we? Um, well, enable <laughs> it's 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 not something that can happen overnight. But the protests, the change that will come with the protests, which one hopes will be positive and productive, mm -hmm. will lead to that, hopefully. And you will end the political interference in the institutions of the state who are there to function independently and impartially. Uh, Omiza, now that um, we have um, such a resurgence of um, individuals, groups, uh, various stakeholders who are interested uh, in educating themselves on their constitutional rights, on their responsibilities, duties, um, and what is owed to them uh, by elected officials. Um, how important is it for um, greater discourse um, that emanates from the people in, in, when we talk about uh, constitutional reform? So we've seen how constitutions have been created, constitutions or amendments have been created in air-conditioned rooms by English-speaking people, um, intellectuals or not, um, people with vested interests. Uh, but how important is, it, is the approach now to be like a bottom-up approach where there's also people's engagement? I think it's extremely important. I and that's something that we've been missing in our sort of political culture, in our sort of civic culture. Mm. Um, on, on one side, we haven't had um, any experience of uh, members of parliament engaging before any kind of law reform with people drawing that consultation and then fashioning the laws that they need. Mm. And uh, understanding of how this happens in other jurisdictions is that there is a long process of consultation, of putting drafts out, of having engagement with those drafts, and then a white paper later, then a draft later, and then developing something that people are comfortable with and also have an understanding of what it is about. Because in this country, we have this kind of ambush um, way in which legislature is legislation is brought out and people are most often trying to figure out how relevant it is, whether it's going to cause them some harm or not. Um, and this really is to the detriment at the end of the day of how we govern ourselves and how we plan our lives as individuals. So I'm hoping really this moment where people are also fired up and engaged um, is also an engagement with the constitution and with the other laws. For example, fairly, I think about a month back, the land development ordinance was reformed. Um, there were some salutary reforms that were also brought in, sort of bringing in uh, a gender, uh, sort of uh, introducing a gender component to it. But there was also a, a clause that said that uh, farmers could also mortgage without state and state permission mm -hmm. their properties to the banks and financial institutions. So this really, um, like, we didn't understand where that came from. Mm. And that means that at this time, where farmers are also going into debt, they are going to be pushed to mortgaging their lands, which they actually are cultivating, okay. to banks and financial institutions. These are state lands sometimes, on grants. What happens? What is the agricultural policy that allows this... Uh, amendment to take place. So this is in the in interest of then the financial institutions that collect on those mortgages, right? So there is no consultation and there is no public centeredness about these reforms. Hopefully with, these, with this new spirit that has been evoked, 
um, we'll see some of that changing and some activism and some engagement, which hopefully will, I don't know, not all of it will stay as we know the moment is sort of fired up, but that's the that's what's keeping the hope alive, right? That we can Absolutely. see it happening right Absolutely. now. Uh, Dr. Saranmuthu, you have been uh, actively involved um, with, for example, the constitutional, the People's um, Representative Committee, or um, efforts to bring in a new constitution. Uh, you were uh, one of the experts uh, who was consulted. Um, Speak to us about this process, these processes of constitutional reform or lawmaking that take place by uh, successive governments. We've seen how it has uh, sort of started, but never really borne any fruit. Well, yes. I mean, I think the reason why it does not sort of bear any fruit, as you say, is, is because there are outstanding issues that the mm. political parties mm. uh, have to resolve amongst themselves before they can go to the people. Yeah. But it's absolutely right. I mean, two things with regard to constitution making in this country. Constitution making in this country has always been limited to lawyers. And I think that is a fatal flaw in limiting it to lawyers mm. because it's a constitution for all the citizens of the of country course. and for people who have a variety of experiences, not just the law. That's one point. The second thing, of course, is, is that that whole process of consultation mm. has really not happened. I think the Yahapalina government did decide to have mm. some consultations, and I think about 5,000 odd uh, representations were sent in, but it's not enough. We really need to go out and talk to people about it. Mm. I mean, for example, I remember a South African constitutional expert telling me about what happened in South Africa. And they said how people came and sort of said that, look, we don't want our cattle stolen. Wow. And that was something that was given into the constitution makers who translated that to be the right to private property. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Beautiful, yeah. You know, so we need to have that consultation. We can't disregard the people and think that they are of lesser quality intellect or no intellect at yeah. all. And hopefully that's what Golface and all of that has done is for the people to have broken through mm -hmm. into now the corridors of decision making and are going to make their voice heard. Absolutely. I mean, we we have uh, an agricultural policy without consulting the farmers. No, so, <laughs> so I mean, yeah. um, I'd also like to uh, discuss the importance of strengthening the administrative service. So how to enable an environment for public officers to act in accordance with their conscience without political inf interference to ensure the independence of the public service. Um, I'd like to go into this article Mm, from yesterday, which says the Sri Lanka Immigration and Emigration Officers Association has decided to step away from its duties in the VIP and CIP lounges at all airports, including the Katnaik International Airport. Um, in this backdrop, speak to us, Dr. Saran Muthu, um, about the importance of strengthening the administrative service. Well, you know. We have had an administrative service in this country which at various times in our history was the envy of the world in that it functioned efficiently, it functioned impartially, it was not undermined by political interference. Mm -hmm. Now, so you can have laws, you can have all sorts of laws and regulations requiring independence and integrity and all of that, but the point is the implementation of those laws. If you had a situation in which the, the politician, the minister, or indeed the prime minister or the president is going to interfere in how you do your work, you either shut up and put up mm. or you go. Now, the constitution allows the president to appoint secretaries to ministries. The secretary to a ministry is the chief accounting officer, as it were of that ministry. We know of countless incidents in which secretaries to ministries and indeed senior people have 
had to bow down to political instruction. Mm -hmm. Some of them have got up and said enough is enough and gone. Yeah, but it is that political interference that we have to stop. So it's not so much the reform of the ad administration per se, but it is getting into the thick skulls of the politicians that the bureaucracy is not there to do their handiwork. Mm -hmm. The bureaucracy is part of the executive and the executive is there to implement policies and to work independently and impartially. So, you know, people always sort of come up and say we need a new law for this and a new law for that. Perhaps the existing laws have overlooked a particular area, but that's not the real issue. The real issue is in terms of politicians recognizing that there is a separation of powers, there is a rule of law, that they are not supposed to be interfering in the administration and government. And the other point, of course, is this, is, is that you have so many people being brought from outside into positions of power and responsibility. The Gotabe Rajpaksa regime has brought in so many ex-army officers. You know, why? Are, we, are they saying that the existing bureaucracy is incompetent? Are they saying that they cannot trust them? Why on earth bring ex-army? What does an ex-army officer know about health? About agriculture? You could make the argument that if he was a health and agricultural expert, it may not have been a very good army officer. Amiza, uh, what's the way forward? In a minute, um, uh, I'd like you to revert back to your point where you said that um, there was a time when uh, debt, the, a decision was made to cancel off debt. Mm -hmm. uh, very quickly, reiterate that point for us before we uh, conclude the show for the benefit of our viewers. So in 1995, when there was a drought and in the dry zone, the farmer, there was a decision taken to cancel the debt of farmers so that they didn't have to pay back debts that they were the microfinance loans that they had incurred already taken on so that immediately eases off the burden and then they whatever they earn they put into their families their food and their own development so that it is possible as a humanitarian in recognition of a humanitarian crisis to take policy decisions to alleviate the hardship that people are facing and we need to see similar decisions right now in recognition of the fact that we are, uh, there is a humanitarian crisis unfolding. We are in the midst of that. And there needs to be decisions that both in terms of our foreign debt, there needs to be also audits to understand the legitimacy and the legality of those debts taken by the state and whether what we need to be paying back and also for those people who are suffering, who are undergoing hardship, that the hardship is not doubled and tripled mm -hmm. as a result of decisions taken in the name of economic, um, like, like, like austerity measures, which will hit hardest if not managed on the working class people, the poor women in particular, and marginalized communities. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Sarvan Muktu, in 30 seconds, what's the way forward? <laughs> <laughs> in 30 seconds, all right. We have a crisis of governance in this country. It has a political dimension and it has an economic dimension. I think the first thing that we need to do in terms of resolving it is get rid of the executive presidency. It has been the single one key impediment and hindrance to proper governance in this country. So we need to get rid of the executive presidency. We need to also recognize that there is a difference between state and government. Mm. There are state institutions, like the central bank, for example. It's a state institution. Mm. It should not be uh, corrupted by political interference. And I would argue that perhaps it should go into the constitution as an independent institution, whereby you, know, you don't have the Ministry of Finance or the presidential secretariat or whoever giving them instructions in terms of what to do. So we need to strengthen the institutions of democratic governance in this country if we are to move forward. All right.
Perfect. 30 seconds. 30 <laughs> seconds on point. All right, fantastic. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining in this discourse. Dr. Pakis Soti Sarmuttu, Executive Director of the Center for Policy Alternatives and Attorney at Law, Ermiza Teagle, thank you. And thank you for watching us. We'll see you again next week. Good night.